All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is the, the virtual visit for the for the summer students. Uh, what I would like to ask uh, from Elias to remove his uh, uh, video. Uh, spotlight for everyone. Yeah. Okay. It's not just because I like to see myself. Indeed, I don't. Um, all right. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zoltan uh, from the CMS control room. I have Andres Delanoy next to me. We have Muhammad, Mohammed, sorry, Mohammed <laughs> be, behind me. He is going to be in the uh, uh, mobile team, and the, the ladies are just hiding behind. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, exactly. Noemi and Haifa, they are going to be together with Mohammed in the underground team. Uh, what before they would go down, I would let me just. Uh, I'm pretty sure you already know about CERN and CMS, at least CERN. Uh, what concerns the, the CMS is that, just, just to let you know where we are sitting at this moment, yes, you might see the share. Uh, so uh, indeed, the, the main campus of CERN is somewhere here where I show with the mouse. Uh, you might see this nice landscape of, of the Lake Geneva and, uh, and the Mont Blanc behind. Uh, Actually, we are sitting just across the, the ring uh, here in the, the nice French countryside in Sassy. Um, so that's just to tell you where we are. I, I will not make any more introduction because that's not needed in my, uh, uh, in my opinion. Uh, however, if you have any questions, please use the chat. In this case, we cannot use the... Uh, Yes, actually, there is, there is a reason why the CMS is so distant from the CERN campus. Uh, let me just explain it, and then I let the, let the mobile team to show the, the control room. So the reason for, for this, this um, situation that we are the, the farthest point from, from the main campus is that uh, the proton punches are, are uh, circulating clockwise and anti-clockwise. And if we want to have the same amount of, of bunch crossings in Atlas and CMS, this is actually this was actually a, a really an aim to do, then we have to, to put them on a point where the 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 distance the, the protons run is the same. So the proton uh, bunch that collides in Atlas with the other proton bunch will collide here in CMS of course, after making half turn each. Okay, so I let me just uh, just allow the CMS mobile camera on, and then I let uh, yeah, you have to start the video, I guess. Yes, you did. So now I can exactly all right and i let you to talk it's mohammed so mohammed do you want to just yes. uh, just like sure this? i've read that to duplicate the voice but yeah welcome everyone to cms control room okay so, so we actually can... we are sitting on the on the surface so distant from the, the main campus. that yeah the main underground Okay, so you want to take over because I will hear my yes, voice. Yes, no, no, just how you hear your voice. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, here is the control room. So we have several substations. The first uh, shift leader, which managed to uh, lead in the detector and respond for the safety of the people. And we have here the DQM shifter, which responds for uh, quality of the data. <coughs> Here we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And here they are. We have uh, here uh, the trigger shifter, but they are all not here because the COVID situation we have, unfortunately. And we have here the DAC system, which uh, responds for start the run. And we have here 
we called it synaptic, which responds for turn off or uh, switch off hardly or switch on the detector, some of the detector or all the detector. Yeah. <laughs> And we have here the technical shifter, which uh, responds for the safety of the detector and uh, the control of all the sub detector. You can see all the screens around him. And here you can see how many people is underground and this elevator, which we used to go underground and the main gates. And yes, and main... we do have camera in the elevator. Yes. <laughs> So yeah, this is mainly the first part of the control room. And we have another part of the control room. We called it the expert detector. So you can see here all the, our experts of the detector are sitting there running a test, turn on, turn off the detector. Okay, with all these computers. But it seems they are very, very busy. So, and also, we have here a champagne of celebrating milestone of CMS. So the, yeah, this is mainly the CMS control room. In the normal cases, we would have like more than five people in the control room, okay? As I said, each one responsible for something for the sub detector or the detector. But right now for the COVID situation, we only have the shift leader, as I said before, and the technical shifter. Most of the shifts or rest of the shifts are, are remotely. So you want to take over? Yes. Okay, so we take over while they go down. Let me just uh, make my camera also on. So that's the that's what you saw is the control room of, of CMS, at least the technical control room, what concerns the, or as we call online control room, what concerns the hardware. Uh, we have another control rooms, what concerns the, the Monte Carlo simulations and the, the data processing. Uh, I think we have one in the Fermilab, we have one in uh, Hamburg, yes, it is. in the DAISY, and uh, I think we have another one. Ah. So, and, and we have several, several small ones. Yes, Mohammed, uh, we yeah, hear you. May I interrupt? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So of course, right now, do. I'm going to underground. So this is the first main gate to go underground. Okay. And to go in, we have to use a special device. We call it dosimeter. Okay. So this dosimeter with a special ID for each one. We have to put it here. But also plus the dosimeter, we have the eye scan, okay? Like uh, what we had in the Angel and Demons movie. I know Zoltan like this movie. Yes, so... exactly. And I always <laughs> and I always make a, a, a remark on this that- uh, Yes, exactly. I so take the, this from you. <laughs> yeah. So the device that was seen on the movie uh, was a very nice uh, cylindric, or no, it's a spherical shape uh, reader, whatever. Yes, we used it, used that type for long, but of course, since the, the movie was, was taken quite long ago, uh, there are newer versions, and this is the, the latest one that we use. Uh, if you saw the movie, uh, you understand why do I say when I'm saying that this is uh, now looking at for both eyes and the blood circulation in both eyes. So, yes, so right now, I passed, I scanned my dosimeter and I scanned my eye. Then the gates allowed to me. Okay, so about this gate, you should be alone in, the, in this gate and you should be in this square, okay? In center of this square. Otherwise the gate will not allow you to pass from there. So you can see here should be in center and should scan your eye. And then you are ready to go. Please remember the color. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Uh, we, will, so, we will return to the color later. I yes. Guess. This is yeah. a point. This is a good point from you. Just uh, <laughs> I have a question later to the audience that about this gate. Okay, with another gate. So let's see if the audience will uh, take notes or will see the So right now we are in the elevator hall. Okay. 
you can see this is the elevator which we're gonna take to go underground. Thank you, Naomi. So I think you already mentioned that Zoltan, but we are going like 100 meter underground. Where is the, our detector? Actually, it is 97. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, this is, not the, this is not the deepest point in CMS. The deepest point is uh, the so-called X0 where we cannot go today. And I think that makes that three. <laughs> but it's not the deepest point in the LHC. Not the deepest point in LHC. Oh, yes. Yes, so Andres. Something that's maybe not uh, not all of you guys may know is that the LHC is not parallel to the ground. It's actually tilted. And that has to do with just the geology of the area. Exactly. Um, and exactly. in fact, that's the, the, the whole reason we have such heavy detectors that we have to build them on the bedrock. And this changes depending on where you are. Uh, so this is why CMS is 100 meters underground, but there's even deeper, I can't remember if it's 0.4 or 0.6, that's 150 or so. I think 0.4 is 140, but indeed, if you if you look at the tilting of the LHC, the, 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 the biggest, the, well, the deepest point is somewhere around the 0.8. The reason why 0.4 is the deepest point is the Tehran. Yeah. <laughs> so the, that goes up much this deeper. Is, this is basically almost at the base of the Jura. Yes, exactly, four. exactly. So you can think of it, well, I don't know if you're familiar with the area, but if you know the Jura Mountains, basically this uh, tilt goes like deeper when it goes close to the yep. Jura Mountains and so, the lake on the other side. Um, we are going underground now with the elevator, yeah. so we may Indeed, have Indeed, that's a the reason. Connection. So that's one of the reasons why why we have two screens now. Um, we yes. expect uh, the mobile team to disappear due to the uh, uh, mobile connection, the nature of the mobile connection. On the way down, we usually lose them. On the way up, we don't. And that somehow uh, is, is in, in connection with the roaming between countries. Upstairs, they see the French network. Downstairs, obviously, we have the, the Swisscom network. So maybe while they're in the elevator, we can say a word about what's going on now. What mm -hmm. is CMS doing? What's uh, the next steps? And uh, just very quickly, I, I can tell you that CMS is preparing for what we call run three. And I think you all have heard about this quite a bit. But uh, what's going on now is we have started to seal the innermost part of the detector. And that in the before we got to that point, we actually replaced the CMS beam pipe. So this is, as you might imagine, is the, uh, the tube through which the particles travel. So again, remember that the protons are traveling through two separate beam pipes. They merge at the interaction yeah. points. So at CMS, we replaced the innermost part, this beam pipe, in anticipation for the high luminosity LHC, where we're going to have a brand new pixel detector that takes us, it, it's going to be so close to the interactions that we need a smaller diameter beam pipe. And also, we, we changed the beam pipe according to this. So, this yes. is a brand new one. Um, uh, actually, this is something that people usually don't think, but we, we removed the beam pipe for the long shutdown for several reasons. One is that the beam pipe central region is made of beryllium. Uh, this is on one, one hand is poisonous, the other hand is extremely expensive to manufacture. So so it was it was better to remove and also we wanted to change the beam pipe so there was no reason to, to have it in. So uh, after the beam pipe installation we installed the innermost detector parts, the the pixels, the pixel barrel, pixel end cap, and also the brill. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so uh, just a, as another note, by the way, here you can almost see the, the top. Yeah, I the think I, I removed my, our picture. Uh, and then, yeah, and so probably is, you see it on a, on a bigger yeah. screen. So this is the elevator shaft, and this is uh, the axis through which uh, that was built for the elevator to go down through. And you can actually almost see the stairwell behind it. So there is a stairwell that we don't use. Uh, we just use the elevator. And you can almost see the top. Well, uh, well, 
maybe not from this point. Uh, 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 oh, yes, yeah, you can <laughs> yes, see the yes, there are. So actually, we have a couple of uh, stairs, two stairs, two different stairs. One, what you see is uh, at an ambient pressure, but uh, also there is a there is a concrete tube which uh, has the elevator in and another rescue uh, staircase. Uh, Mohammed, why do we have this? So I, I couldn't hear you, sorry. Okay, okay. Uh, so so the, the, the thing was that we uh, discussed about the, the vertical shaft, uh, namely the, uh, the elevator runs in a, in a uh, concrete, uh, uh, well, shaft, <laughs> another shaft, uh, which is pressurized indeed. So the elevator is uh, considered to be a safe place, even in case of Havaria. If you manage to get to the elevator lobby, you are safe and the fire brigade will come and rescue you. Uh, apart from this, the elevator is, uh, is working in a completely uh, different power scheme than the experiment itself. It has its own diesel generator. So if the power goes out, we still have the elevator. This is really, really the opposite what you used to hear or what you used to see in tall buildings, in skyscrapers, for example, that in case of a fire, you shouldn't use the elevator, you should use the staircase. In our case, this is completely the opposite. You should always use the elevator first. So speaking of uh, this kind of situations where we can lose power, uh, what Mohammed is showing us right now, yeah. part of the systems that you see are actually systems that do not, especially the ones with these orange lines, mm -hmm. these systems do not get interrupted. They have redundant power because they need to continue to operate if there's a loss in power. And some of these systems are for, uh, these look like PLCs to me, but they monitor uh, the status of the detector. And this could be temperatures, this could be humidity and so on. So these systems are meant to monitor the detector and make sure that the conditions are safe for the detector and to take action uh, in case that there is conditions that are dangerous. For the this is as we call the detector safety system. And this, this cannot turn go. on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This cannot turn on any detector, but to turn off. Yes, exactly. Um, so in this room, uh, we call this the counting room or the service cavern. And we have, as, as we've mentioned, there's a lot of these PLC systems, but there's many SLR. other things. I think Mohammed is just about to show these are, uh, most of the cables you see here are fiber optic cables and they're going into uh, what we call, well, these are basically FPGA based boards and they are reading uh, detector information and it's a little bit difficult to tell exactly what is you know what corresponds to what but a lot of these I think correspond to the DAQ system so the data acquisition is taking information from a lot of different places and processing this information some of these might be uh, the part of the tracker so it mm -hmm. might be receiving information from the tracking system and processing in some way. Uh, now, some of these may be part of the triggering system. I'm not quite sure, but uh, the triggering, uh, I mean, it's a very big part of any LHC experiment and I'm sure you guys have heard a bit about it, but just as a sort of reminder, uh, we need to select or filter out what we would consider interesting events. Because and otherwise we would need a terabit a second network, which obviously yes. doesn't exist. Uh, we, we are not able to read out the 120 million channels of the detector 40 million times per second. And even if we would be able to do that, we would not be able to store it. And if we would be able to store it, we would not be able to process it. Exactly. So that's a very important thing. We have to, to filter out all those or select all those uh, uh, events that are probably interesting. Yeah. What is interesting? That's a complicated uh, question. Well, well, uh, we have we have a good example among many other things. The the interesting thing. So actually, what we are interested in is the deeply inelastic scatterings. So uh, 
most the, of the, what I would call the exciting collisions. Exactly. <laughs> Otherwise, the 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 elastic scatterings are just just bouncing off from each other, even if the proton explodes. Oh, go Gators! Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so even if the proton explodes, uh, nothing interesting happens. Just uh, an exchange of momentum and energy. However, the deeply inelastic scattering means that there is a, a change from mass to energy, energy to mass, and this is indeed what we are interested in. So, uh, for example, one, one good indicator, among many others, one good indicator of the, of the interesting event is the muon. So, if, so there, there are many things in the proton before collisions, but, there are no muons. but, but muons, exactly. <laughs> so if you see a muon flying out ex at the exact time from the, the collision point, then of course you can immediately think that something interesting happened. Otherwise the muon is a very interesting thing because this is a, a, a charged particle that of course that goes in one direction or, or in, a, in a curve uh, and it hits only muon detectors that are close to each other. So these muon detectors can discuss very easily and very efficiently that I, I saw something. Yes, I saw something as well. Oh, well, well, well if we three and they, and they out of the four, that. they can report that information very quickly. So exactly. We start the trigger. So they can they can instruct the the DAQ to read out all the 120 million channels. This can happen sometimes. I think uh, at the 100 kilohertz. So. 100,000 times per second. And once all these data are read out, they go upstairs just above ourselves. Uh, we have something like a 15,000 CPU that can, that have in enormous time, I think it's a couple of microseconds to tell whether the signature of the whole event is interesting or not. And this further reduces the, the events to one kilohertz. So we record something like 1,000 events per second, uh, indeed on tape, <laughs> but the tape is not here, but in the in the the, the uh, tier zero, right? So, yeah, very, yeah. Very quickly, just to talk a little bit about what you guys can see, uh, I think uh, you just showed a lot of. Uh, yeah, this is the or... door of LHC. So behind this door, you can find our yeah. favorite Remember color. Remember the color. Yeah, <laughs> this <Sorry>. color is <laughs> red, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for the other color. But yeah, behind this door, you will see this beautiful. I, I, view. Have, a, I have a picture uh, in, actually, I just wanted to show this while I'm trying to let the late people to come in. So actually what you see here is the, the map of the underground facilities of at CMS at point five. If I can pull my mouse, yes. So Muhammad uh, and the ladies are here at this point in this cavern, what we call underground service cavern. And this is really next to the, uh, the experimental cavern, the UXC. There is a, a seven meter thick iron concrete pillar or pillar or wall in between them. The reason for that is, is twofold. One is the, the radiation shielding, but maybe the main thing is, is uh, civil engineering. This pillar is needed to keep the two, two uh, underground galleries uh, integrity. Yeah, you can imagine that uh, the service cavern has a lot of uh, you know, a lot of racks of electronics and it's very heavy. But then on the other side of this, uh, of this pillar, you have our detector, which is twice as heavy as the Eiffel Tower. So it's much heavier and you need this, uh, this large pillar in between seven meters uh, wide just to keep things stable. So this was just an interrupt and I give back to Mohammed to, to So explain. yeah, as, as I was saying, this door, behind this door, just we have this beautiful HL, uh, LHC tunnel. And we can have here the story beginning from the 
hydrogen bottle, which support us with a hydrogen, but is just as up to date as Linux mm -hmm. 4 right now. But you can imagine this is a small bottle, which responds to provide all the LHC with the hydrogen because, or the proton, because once you remove the electron from the proton, from the hydrogen, you have the proton. So one, one very quick remark is that I, some of you guys might already know this, but the LHC is in the process of, well, they, I would say Joe, they already commissioned an upgrade to the LINAC, which is the first stage of acceleration. Mm -hmm. And now there's a new facility. Uh, we've upgraded from LINAC 2 to LINAC 4, and it's already providing beams. And this is brand new for run three. So it's very exciting. Exactly, exactly. That's the, yeah. the latest thing. Uh, and this is part of the luminosity upgrade, which is a tenfold luminosity yeah. uh, upgrade with respect but, to the present status. Right, but not quite yet. We're, we're yeah, doing exactly. run three. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we're just starting in March next year. And the conditions, uh, the collisions will be about roughly the same as we've had before. Uh, but we are, of course, preparing for the big high luminosity upgrade, which is it's still a few years away. Exactly. One step at a time. Yes. <laughs> this uh, is very complicated. But, but I mean, it's such a large step, uh, such a, you know, increase in the rate of collisions that there are changes everywhere that are needed, not just for the LHC, but also for the detectors. So all of the experiments around the LHC ring have been preparing exactly. for years and years. Uh, and are making the necessary adjustments. However, what concerns the LHC, uh, we we know it since long that the long shutdown three will be an extra long shutdown. Yes. Even without COVID. Exactly. Uh, so that that will be several. I think almost five years, uh, because many parts of the LHC has to be changed. For example, the final focus magnets in front and behind the experiments. Yeah. So something I always like to mention when you look at the uh, sort of the process of injecting protons into the LHC is just the history behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always interesting to me to think about, well, the PS was the most powerful, most exciting accelerator of its time, and now it's just there in service of the LHC. And the same applies to the SPS. Uh, Nobel prizes were won for the for several discoveries. <laughs> sorry, well, for sorry for, for yeah, interruption. Go yeah, go ahead. But yeah, okay, so. Can anyone tell tell us what is the difference between this gate and the first gates we enter from? Yeah. Remember the color. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Two people said color. In the so what was the color? So, but the color. The color is 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 really an important <laughs> thing. It's not just yeah. a, a yes, random exactly. painting at CERN. Uh, may I go ahead, or you want to? Please, 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 also. I will so, just show them how to pass. Okay, okay, but please go ahead. Okay, you you remember the green color pad on the surface. If if you happen to break through that, there will there will be no consequences concerning the the LHC. Of course, you have to to invent a, a nice uh, story why you did this, but this will not make any hardware interlock on the machine. Instead, yellow and red gates and doors. Or do have a hardware interlock. The red one, what you saw, uh, if you open it, it immediately shuts down the 27 kilometers ring uh, and you lose the so-called patrol. So there will be a, quite an, uh, uh, a lengthy uh, workaround to be able to operate it again. The yellow doors might let you go through without losing the patrol but if you break through them you will definitely shut down the uh, not just the experiment but as well as the ring as well and since everything is recorded you might see the camera on the right uh, from this sign uh, since everything is recorded you definitely have to have a good reason why you it really needs to be an emergency exactly and and as well as uh, it is not just shutting down the the, the things but also uh, alerting the the fire brigade and so so there will be a large fuss about i think we can hand it over to mohammed yes so exactly the most yeah, most so interesting part is just coming now yeah I in the meantime we got a, yeah, in the meantime we got a lot of questions wow um, okay but welcome everybody to cms so this is 
the moment which we waited for to see the CMS how it looked like alive. Okay. And you can imagine how it big is it. So I will go a bit closer and try to show you some details. Before you would start, uh, there was a question. Uh, has it happened before that people have broken through those doors? Yes. Fortunately, we, we never had, at least here at CMS, we never had a Havaria that would have required to break through these doors, but we often have safety drills when we do need to, to go through these doors without badging and doing the, the stuff. That is a protocol what to do in this case. Uh, this is the same, well, uh, probably you didn't, since, since this is an online uh, uh, summer student course, probably you didn't need to participate in the basic safety course of, of CERN, but you should know that in case of, of uh, Havaria, when you break through these doors, you have to, uh, to get together at a, a emergency point or assembly point. In this case, in our case, this is the, the entrance to the site, but almost every building or at least very very frequently at the CERN site there are assembly points and in case of a Havaria you should uh, assemble there. Okay, thanks very much, sorry for interrupting. So yeah, uh, as I was saying, this is our CMS detector. So you can think in CMS as a onion structure. So it's a kind of layers with each layer correspond to sub detector. And we have a sub detector for dedicated for each particle. For instance, we have a, a, a sub detector dedicated for electric charge, which we call the tracker. And the tracker, which will be the closest point to the beam. And by the, by the way, you can see here is the beam where the protons is crossing by. And inside, very close to the beam, you can see the tracker is located here and around the tracker we have another sub detectors with dedicated to energy particles like electron and photon and uh, above of that we have the magnet which so, Mohammed, we can say maybe maybe you can point out the edge of the magnet so it's a little bit clear i cannot there. so it's the it's the disk uh how to describe it so it's the it's the inner if you look at the the red section which is the muon section uh right inside of that there's a ring a silver looking ring and that's just the edge of the superconducting solenoid for cms exactly exactly so that's, oh, yeah. the, that's the cylinder there uh let me just uh share let me just share the this picture yeah so perfect. in this picture in this picture this is more or less what you see in live uh you see the 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 magnet cylinder from the side you see the end cap pulled off from the detector and uh, on this screen you might see this onion structure very nicely the the tracker together with the pixel detector the electromagnetic calorimeter, this uh, azure, uh, the yellow stuff with the hadron calorimeter, all these are encapsulated in the magnet volume. And uh, outside the magnet volume, we have the red stuff, which is the magnet yoke that returns the, returns the magnetic field or encapsulates it. And this is interleaved with uh, muon detectors. I, I'd exactly. like to say a few more words. Yes, yes, I'm go ahead. Showing a cool view of the... uh, which one? This one or the no, real just one? To show the video. Okay, then just. So I, I first wanted to say that you guys are getting an excellent view of the detector because even if you come and you visit the detector, you're not going to be able to go to the top floors and check out the view that you can see right now. So this is a great opportunity to see the detector. And then I just wanted to say a few more things about. The design of the detector, which I perhaps you already know, but uh, CMS, as Sultan mentioned, has many, many layers, but it's also cut into what we call slices. So we have about 15 of these slices, mm -hmm. and we can move the slices. And you can imagine if you pretend the 
detectors an accordion, you can open the accordion and move the slices. And but not the, you know, all of them at the same time. Yes, it's <laughs> of course. The det detector cavern is unfortunately limited. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a limited amount of space, and there's many many things that uh, that need to be considered. Like it, you know, the the fl the floor of the cavern, as Sultan said, is about 97 uh, meters underground, but there's a slight tilt. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has implications on how you can move these uh, these slices. Uh, but just ge very generally speaking, I just wanted to say that even though this is a very nice time to look at the detector, uh, you can really only see, for, for example, right now, you mostly see the muon system. Mm -hmm. uh, you have this disk, and this is the end cap disk. Uh, and you can, there's, we, at CMS, we have multiple different muon systems. But just to give you an idea, this end cap contains that disk is mostly muon systems, and oh. then there's a nose. So we call this part the, the part that protrudes out. We call this the nose, and this is uh, part of the calorimeter systems. At CMS, we have two calorimeter systems, an electronic calorimeter and hydronic calorimeter. And just to give you a, a very quick uh, sort of uh, so some interesting facts about it. So the electromagnetic calorimeter is uh, very unique to CMS because it's made up of these uh, basically lead blocks that are infused with, with tungsten and they become see-through, right? So these are transparent. It is very similar to the glass, which is uh, sodium silicate, if I'm not completely wrong. And if in this one, you change the sodium to lead, you get those really nice dishes, what my mother used to, to, Can I go here? to cook things in. That's the lead glass. Interesting. Um, uh, the, it survives the, the four, the, the, uh, the uh, yep. Uh, but if you change furthermore, the silicium to, to uh, tungsten, then you get this lead tungstenate, what we use, this is completely uh, uh, transparent, at least it was when it was made, uh, but it is, as you said, more than 80% yeah. of heavy metal. So it's heavy like a metal, it's very dense, but most interestingly for us, it produces light when a particle, an energetic particle goes through it. Uh, so we want to absorb these particles and the amount of light that is produced, it gives us an idea of the energy of those particles. So this is an amazing view here. We, you know, the guys are right on top of the detector. And this is a view that you would not really get otherwise. So you can see there's some cranes, but I actually wanted to point out that there's also some, uh, you can kind of see some of the cryogenic systems for mm -hmm. the superconducting solenoid. Um, and just another few words about the solenoid. It's really at the heart of CMS. It's part of its name. And it's a six meter inner diameter superconducting single piece cylindrical uh, superconducting solenoid. And when it's cold enough, cryogenic, really, really cold, it's like 4.2 Kelvin. Uh, we use liquid helium. When it's at that temperature, we can circulate up to 18,000 amperes of current, which generates 3.8 Tesla. So this is a very remarkable system. It's the largest magnet of its kind in the world. And it's big enough to contain, as Sultan said, most of the system, except for the muon system, everything else is within the, the solenoid volume, which is the-, the You might part of see the, on this picture somewhere, uh, on the near side, YB0, sorry for the, the cryptic language, uh, Mohammed, if you would turn there, YB0 so can look near. down a little bit? Yeah, a, li a little bit look down. Yeah, no, 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 no. yeah, yeah. But turn, turn back, turn to the right a bit, turn to the right a bit, and down. So this, the central slice, yeah. YB0. No, no, no. Should be, oh, yes, exactly. Here you might see the current leads. Uh, to the to the to the magnet and somewhere in the the back, the the five cubic meter helium reservoir is is hidden, where we just simply gravitationally pour the oh yeah that's over there, uh, where we just simply pour the the helium on the 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 magnet. This is something yeah. really really interesting. And there's there's many very fascinating aspects of it. You know these are superconducting solenoids, so there's 
an issue, which we call a quench, when the magnet loses superconductivity, you have to remove those 18,000 repairs of current immediately. Otherwise, this magnet will essentially explode. Um, so that's also part of uh, all the considerations. And there's, in addition to that, it's superconducting. There's magnet training and all sorts of fascinating stuff. The probability of the quench depends, uh, of course, there, there is an inherent quench probability due to the, the mechanical assembly of the, the magnet, but also it depends on the wearing of the mechanical anchor points of the magnet. And of course, due to the extreme forces of, of uh, ramping up, ramping down, and probably in some cases of the, of the, the fast discharging, uh, you wear out these anchor points. And if the quench probability reaches 50%, that's the end of the lifetime. Wow. That is some obscure way to measure it at <laughs> CMS. And what we know, so uh, as far as I remember, the magnet was designed for something like the several hundreds of, of magnet cycles, but uh, uh, the magnet cycles don't, don't think that this is a real magnet cycle. This is something like a, a V route. Um, what we measure is that we are in a better situation than what we would calculate from the real number of, of uh, magnet cycles. So if we don't do something very bad, we are safe. <laughs> so, sorry, Mohammed, can you go? Back? I, I, yeah, I have a question for the audience. So, as Andres was saying, the CMS is a slice, so we do can move this slice. So how many guys do you think we need to push <laughs> these guys together? How? <laughs> do we have answer? Yes, there is one message. Yeah. Two. Two. Okay. <laughs> I think we need so four. Two, two Superman. <laughs> <laughs> But indeed, well, uh, Mauricio yes, is please. not far from the from the reality. I think we need something like four, but definitely less than ten. <laughs> well, the answer is zero because we have here this uh, orange. So we need people to operate it. That's why I said. Yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but mainly, we use this orange feet to push the pressure downside, so it can raise up the sector a little bit. Uh, over ground and then we can move the slides so I, I think it's compressed air that's uh, yes, pushed compressed through air. and yes. it just allows the friction to be low enough so that these can exactly. be moved and you can see these cables here uh, that you know this is what actually gets pulled by these machines these motors uh, so it's not actually people pulling these mm -hmm. a good question has just arrived why the detector actually arranged in slices uh, since it is a compact detector and you know, this is the the towing machine which is actually really small with respect to the yeah. detector slices that can reach uh, more than 1000 tons uh, but uh, sorry for for uh, making you jump up and up and down Mohammed but if you could show the the um, surface of the barrel which is quite close to you so in this case Rafaela would immediately understand and everybody understands that the detector, we have to bring out the cables of the detector, we have to reach the detector parts, but uh, uh, if it would be one monolithic detector, actually it would not be able to be serviced. Instead, we have one slice here and between the slices, we have the, the, the possibility to, to bring out the cables, bring in the cooling, all the, all the, gas, the services. All cooling, the services. Yeah. And these, the, these slices can be moved individually Thanks to a cable chain Ooh, below that allows, uh, yeah, exactly. This is the this is the, the you can see the gap between the, the gap slices. between yeah exactly. But but let let me just to be to make it a bit Ooh, more clear. I mean, the our detector is when we say compact, we mean dense, and what that's what it means to me. There's very few gaps. You, you cannot fit a person in there, right? So as Sultan said, but, if but this, my equipment works there exactly. <laughs> so. <laughs> What Sultan is saying is like, if you build the detector and it's, you can no longer push the slices apart, uh, it would be impossible to service the detector, to change cables or change the cooling or upgrade the detector. 
And there's there's just many aspects like this, uh, but also the fact that this also allowed the detector to be built on the surface. And then the, each of the slices was craned down. And of course, the but something that's interesting is the center slice, what we call YB0, it incorporates the superconducting solenoid. So that was the heaviest and the largest because the, it's one slice and then the magnet, the it sort of protrudes out and you have the cylinder that's sort of inside of this. Uh, and we could move that, I part, just, but we don't yeah. use to. Okay. So there, there are some fixed connections there. There, were some, there was some discussion about that we have to follow the, the, the beam line and we should shim it up with one millimeter. Um, so this we could do. Of course, this would make a, a lot, lots of work. But usually, we don't move the center apart, only the, the external ones. Uh, the question is that how often do we do this? Uh, well, uh, during the, this long shutdown, too, we did it quite often because we had to rearrange the, the spaces between the detector parts, LO2. And uh, organizing that work. Is a lot. It's a Just nightmare. coordinating that. <laughs> you have to have a plan for every day. Who's doing what work? How long will it take? Who's responsible? And what is going to be used? What's going to be used? Is there any safety issues? Uh, which teams are going to be where? And are there going to be collisions in terms of... Uh, uh, it's very, very complicated. Mm. But, uh, I find yeah. Noemi are just yeah, showing <laughs> the, the actual sizes. So can apart see the from... The, yeah. yeah. Apart from the, the long <laughs> shutdown, the uh, obviously, we, we close the detector for, for running, for data taking. Uh, between LS1 and LS2, we opened it every year, but only the end caps, not the bottle. Right. I just have a small trick to show it to you, if I may to interrupt. So yeah. here is the, a very normal paper clips, and this is iron, okay? This is not a magnet, sorry. <laughs> This is iron. This is not a magnet. Okay. So let's see what will happen. Ooh la la. Ooh la la. Of wow. course, we are cheating. Yeah. <laughs> so anybody because of can... the glue. <laughs> yeah. Hidden glue. <laughs> Anyone can explain this trick? How Naomi can hold these paper clips? Oh, nice. Like Together. Do we have answer from the audience? <laughs> it's also going to be online, so you can find it on YouTube. Well, just... Or maybe how many paper clips we can hold it together? Oh, yeah, somebody had a. Yeah, exactly. Bingo. We yes. got the good answer. <laughs> the residual magnetization. Yes, exactly. So the, hey. the magnetic, the 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 iron structures behave like this. That even after you remove the the, the magnetic field, it, it, it gets magnetized a little bit. So that's, yeah. you, that's a really good view right here. So you can almost see. So as I was saying at, at some point, uh, at the moment, you can mostly see the muon system, which is the red and silver parts uh, at the outermost diameter. And then you have this ring right inside of it. And that's the edge of the superconducting solenoid. But then inside, you see the sort of silver colored lining and it's very hard to tell you what's in there because you don't really see. But imagine there's like cylinders in there. We call them barrels. And you would have the hadronic calorimeter. Within that, you would have the electromagnetic calorimeter. And then within that, you have this volume where you keep the tracker. And there's the tracker. And then inside, it's a pixel detector. And that, as we have uh, previously mentioned, the tracker has stayed in place. It's scheduled to be replaced for this uh, high luminosity LHC. So this will be done during the third long shutdown. But the pixel detector came out. And there was some work done to it. But the same pixel detector was reinstalled. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it, even if, if the, this area were open still, it, it is now sealed, but even if it were open, you couldn't really see much of the innermost part of the detector because everything is so densely packed uh, in there. Uh, and as Sultan said, I, I work on this uh, luminosity systems and those were installed right after the pixel detector. So this is, uh, there was a platform here a couple, like last week, uh, there was a platform here that allowed us to work 
in this innermost part right around the beam pipe, which is very exciting. Otherwise, you have to use these uh, blue and orange lifting devices and the the yellow one, the cherry picker uh, to, to reach up. Um, we had some, some nice questions. What is the biggest upgrade you will make to the CMS experiment? I wouldn't call biggest, but let me just explain what we plan. So we have already mentioned the exchange of the of the pixel detector, the upgrade. Uh, uh, we will have to remove the tracker. Probably parts of the tracker are going to be upgraded. Uh, we have to remove it because we have to uh, uh, replace the electromagnetic calorimeter during LS3. So I'm talking about the LS3 uh, uh, things. We are going to change the nose that you saw on the end cap. We are going to change it completely. Uh, Which is a very interesting project. This is a very interesting project. We, we, are, we drop out the electromagnetic calorimeter and the hadron calorimeter and the pre-shower yes. detector, and we make one unique high granularity calorimeter system there. Right. And it's very complicated also because it, it's using both silicon-based technology and calorimeter-based technologies and sort of fusing that into one single structure. Exactly. And at the same time, it will measure the electromagnetic and the hadronic particles. So it has to make a good filtering among them. Uh, so this nose is going to, to go and, yeah. and new one will, will be back. We are going to extend the, the jam detectors. Now we installed the GE11 station during this shutdown. Uh, between the so, two shutdowns, we are going to install the second layer, the GE21s. So just to uh, maybe elaborate. So the what we call the gems are muon systems that use uh, a technique called gas electron. This is uh, a brand new technology. Uh, right. So it's this brand new was technology. developed during the last 20 years. Right. So these are very fast detectors that we can use to trigger on muons. Uh, and that's one of the newer, and you have to sort of, all these upgrades are very complicated in the sense that you have to design, you have to develop these technologies and make sure they're mature. Make sure you have to test the hell out of these technologies. And this requires, you need to propose the design. You need to have funding for testing, beam, beam tests. And uh, by the time that a lot of the technology makes it into the detector, it's already been a lot of years. Uh, and just, you know, even constructing these components. And so just to give you an idea, like the, I mentioned earlier for the electromagnetic calorimeter, we have these, uh, lead tungsten crystals. These were grown. You have to grow them, and each one of them takes about two days to grow in the lab. These are monocrystals. And they're monocrystals, yeah. So you have to grow them very carefully. And there's 76 or 77,000. 77, Usually 7, I used to cheat this number, yeah. Yeah. So let's <laughs> say 77,000 of them. And that just growing the crystals, that took 10 years. So when we talk about these upgrades, it's incredibly exciting for us because we it, not only are there new technologies that are cutting edge, but since they've taken quite a few years for us to get to this point, it's a lot of work that's been put in by a lot of people and it's very exciting when it's actually put in place. And I wouldn't rank any one of them uh, before or in front of any other. So all of them are equally important. Actually, we are going to have a timing layer in order to, to make a better timing. Yeah as well. So, so there are lots of improvements that we can expect, let's say, in 10 years from now. Yes. And it's, it's uh, a lot of it is to cope with this higher rate of collisions. Uh, the MIP timing detector that you mentioned, for example, is a very fascinating project because it allows us to, to use time. You can read it out so quickly, you know, nanosecond. Uh, uh, so you can sort of with, look within time slices of the collision. You know, We say we can collide up to every 25 nanoseconds. This thing can tell you what's going on like even with more granularity than that. Exactly. So you can see some of the surfaces here and these are uh, a lot of the high voltage cables. Uh, generally, we will have a lot of high voltage, low voltage cables and a lot of fiber optics that are in and around the detector and then cooling. Cooling is also very fascinating. So here you can see, uh, this is again the elevator shaft and here it's easier to yes. show the surface. <laughs> and one of the things that I remember Sultan talking about when they were showing this area here is that 
there's so many things to take into consideration. For example, just the airflow. Mm -hmm. And the, the cavern needs to have a very specific airflow. So the air has to come into our experiment and then that airflow needs to be redirected into the LHC uh, tunnel, essentially. And this is just, you can imagine like there could be dust in the air or whatever particulate. Uh, we don't want it to escape, right? We need, if it becomes a bit radioactive, even if it's a little bit, we want to retain that into, you know, in the experimental cavern and if possible into the LHC. Exactly. Tunnel. So therefore we make different pressurized uh, regions uh, the service cavern is at normal ambient pressure, but the uh, experimental cavern is already a little bit of a, of, a, of a depressed pressure, something like 20 Pascal. Uh, in order to, to make that, we have a, about a seven meter long concrete slab that we use to slide into this, uh, this region. I think uh, it was shown. Yeah, exactly. If you go. turn over, you will you you will be able to show it to us. Um, you mean this? That's exactly. You see, you yeah. see the slab uh, on the back that slides in you and and seals SOR. this this zone. Obviously, on the top of the you other shaft, the, the big SOR. shaft, we have a sliding uh, concrete uh, 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 pit head cover, which is uh, more than two meters thick, um, more iron than than concrete and that can also uh, um, seal off the uh, experimental cavern so actually just just again as a boulevard uh, information yeah. <laughs> uh, on that slab on that uh, 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 sliding concrete slab uh, we used to have parties really of course if we don't have covid around um, that's a 400 square meter free space uh, when we yeah when it is closed we used to have the surface team of the virtual visits from there so so it goes over this this is the access shaft and yeah so the this cover that sultan is talking about is on the surface and it goes over the over this shaft yeah and even just building the shaft was also fascinating just <laughs> so so you, I, I'm sure you guys already know that the LHC uh, was predated by the by the LEP accelerator, the Large Electron Positron Collider. So the actual tunnel was already here uh, before the LHC started. But the actual site of P5, there used to be nothing here. So for the LHC, uh, the 0.5 uh, site for CMS had to be built from scratch, and the shafts have to be excavated. And in this particular site, there were a couple of things uh, that sort of stood in the way. So one of the first things is that they discovered uh, some remains of a Roman villa. Which is OK. But yeah. apart from this, what can go wrong will go wrong. Yeah, so, so after that, <laughs> it, everybody said, OK, now here we go. Let's start digging. And they also had problems with just digging the shaft because there was just running water through the yeah. ground. Yeah, maybe you, you can ask the audience. How do you remove the water from the yeah Sultan do you the want to... uh, yeah exactly so so actually they they use the traditional technology uh, of uh, freezing away the the shaft uh, with brine and excavating the the material the the rock which from is basically inside. very cold salt water exactly so usually yeah. this is what what people use uh, in my country uh, we used it for the for building large hotels next to the river Danube, which is a very, very similar situation. However, a couple of meters below the ground, they got an underground river and they couldn't freeze away the river. So they had to change the brine to liquid nitrogen. And this took two extra year <laughs> of the... So the, you can imagine just the... I mean, this is more civil engineering, which is not my expertise, but it's also fascinating all the challenges that were in place. I always and, admire how they do exactly. these things. And, and just, just building the underground areas, there's a lot of challenges. We mentioned the, the pillar that's, that supports things in between. Uh, just There's many, many challenges and just the expense also. Of, you know, the reason we don't have even more room down here 
in the cavern is it's also very expensive to yeah, build. This is the most expensive part. The civil engineering is always the most expensive mm -hmm. part. Uh, for example, if uh, Mohammed can can show the the end cap wheel in 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 size, so from left to the you right in one arm. picture, you will see that this is a huge you equipment. Oh yeah, let's start it from another chapter. Sorry. So uh, yeah. <laughs> making the the underground facilities or building them, as Andre told, uh, even without the the underground river, was a very complicated and it was known since the beginning. So therefore, we've chosen to build the detector on the surface in the surface building, the SX building, surface experimental hall, and then lower the slices one by one down. Among them, the most, the heaviest one was 2,200 tons. Uh, when we lowered them, we uh, we had to do it through this uh, this large shaft, but this large shaft couldn't be uh, arbitrary wide. What we had to choose that the shaft is just 10 centimeters bigger in diameter than the and the end cap or the, the, the slice sizes. And this is just to clarify again, the heaviest slice is the one that contains the magnet. So it's also the largest and the mm -hmm. heaviest. And you just said, and it's uh, not, not even just expensive. It is one in the world. There's no spare, right? We don't have one like tucked away. Somewhere. Exactly. This is not, not about the money. Right. Money doesn't count here. Yeah. <laughs> and you just have 10 centimeters on each side of the shaft as you were lowering this. So uh, a lot of people were very nervous, but uh, yeah. managed to go through. One lowering problem. took eight hours and not, uh, I think it's 14 seconds or something. Otherwise. As a matter of fact, I think I remember reading that the, a special crane had to be sourced or contracted. Mm -hmm that was then used to build a stadium, like a football stadium. So it was like a specialized crane that had to be running. This is no more cold crane. This is a logistic machine. A logistic machine, <laughs> interesting. So this size, actually there are not infinite number of these of these uh, cranes, logistic machines on, on this planet. Uh, you can imagine that this is something around 10. Wow. And the one that we sourced for the, the, uh, the lowering Operation, had a very tight schedule. And actually that year when we used it or when we uh, planned to finish the, the lowering, it had to be moved to South Africa to build the stadium of the World Cup Football Cup uh, that year. Uh, you can imagine that we couldn't delay the operations. Yeah, schedule was tight. <laughs> yeah. Mohamed? Yes. I'm still here. So uh, I don't know if you already mentioned that or not, but uh, as you already know right now, we our detector is a slice. So this we called it this in the cap, okay? Mm -hmm. And we have the, the exactly the same in the other side. I'm gonna show you. And just one quick remark in case it wasn't clear. So this nose that sticks out from the end cap that goes inside of the magnet, right? So this is the, this nose we can call the end cap of the calorimeters. It's still enclosed in the magnetic field and inside of the physical solenoid. Mm -hmm. And you can see the symmetry of our detector. Exactly. So you can see it's exactly the same, which is in other side, okay? But this side we call the positive side and the other side, which you already see is the negative side. And in the middle, we called it barrel, okay? And exactly the same component which you can find in the indicap, you can find in barrel, except one thing, it's, uh, the magnet is still in barrel, not in indicap, but in indicap once it's uh, closest, so it's covered by magnet, okay? So if I go in a closer, I can show you something interesting that, so this, the red thing, this is the Mion system, which Andres was talking about, okay? Here in the VN system, we have two different subdetectors. We call it RPC and DDT. And here also the big circle, this one is also the MUN system. It's also RPC plus different subdetector. We call it CSC. Okay. So, uh, a quick word is these 
muon systems, they're all, we actually, now if we count the gems, we have four different muon systems, but they all have different characteristics. They are all gas-based detectors. So and when therefore our, they are slow. Yes, but still <laughs> RPCs are fast enough. To, yeah, so, to so actually, this is exactly what I wanted to point yeah. out, that that the, the gas detectors like the drift tubes or the cathode strip chambers are slow. If you want to make a good triggering, then they are not the perfect for uh, perfect uh, choice for that. But the RPC and the jam are extremely fast detector parts. They can they cannot give very exactly the track, but they can tell that a muon went through. Yeah, and this is very important. So just maybe as a quick, very quick quiz. Again, muons are super important to CMS. It's also part of the name. But why, you know, Maybe let's let's CMS put it this way. Alarm. I mentioned CMS weighs twice as much as the Eiffel Tower. That happens to be 14,000 tons. Of those, no there is 12,500 tons that are dedicated to the muon or the, the magnet yoke return. And that is meant to slow down the muons. But why does do they need to, why do we need to slow down the muons to detect them? Maybe if you know the answer, yeah. this might have been part of your I lecture. Of course, well, you, you are reading my mind. I was about to ask this exactly this question. Why do we have all of these subdetectors so to just why detect would, the I millions? Would, <laughs> I would reformulate the question. Uh, okay. The CMS is a 14,000 ton uh, heavy detector. Why the Atlas? What is doing exactly the same? What we do is only a 7,000 tons. But it's eight much, times the volume. It's much bigger. Yeah. Uh, what is the reason why we've chosen these two different ways? Uh, the answer is that you want to measure the momentum of the muon. If you want to measure the momentum of the muon, you want to deflect it. The, you want to make path. it bend. Exactly. Make, it, make the path bend. Yeah. And uh, from this mm -hmm. bend path, the, the uh, helical bending, you can you can make a good fit only if the bending is sufficiently large. Exactly. You cannot fit a, a, a very short track that is almost uh, straight. You need a bending. Yeah. In order to make a bending, you can do two things. One is that you put it in a huge magnetic field, which will bend it sufficiently, or you can put it in a smaller field, but you let it fly. And that's the two difference between Atlas and CMS. Atlas uses a smaller magnetic field, though very complex, uh, and lets the, the muon to fly. Uh, but of course, the, the, the bending of the path depends on the magnetic field from point to point. And that means that they have to know the magnetic field from point to point at a very high accuracy. They measured it, uh, even knowing that the, the metal bars that hold together the experiment, they, they alter the magnetic fields a little bit. So they, they made this measurement very precisely. But of course, the, this precision that dominates their systematic error on the minimum one and two measurement. Mm -hmm. In our case, our detector is calculated such a way, and this gives the, the mass indeed, that the muon system, at least in the bottle, the muon system should run at the saturation magnetic field of the iron. So this is calculated such a way. And we have a homogeneous magnetic field around two Tesla in the magnetic, in the, 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 the bottle region. Uh, therefore, we don't need to measure. So just to, just to kind of elaborate a bit more. So like within the magnet, we have 3.8 Tesla, but right outside the magnet, we have a bunch of iron, and there is the return of the magnet, let's say. Exactly. And that still generates about two Tesla. About two Tesla. Which, about... is, which is the Atlas magnetic field. Yeah, altogether. exactly. But this is the saturation field yeah. of the iron. Therefore, it guarantees a homogeneous field. Of course, we have some measurements mm -hmm. here and there. Uh, this makes that, that the, the muon path is predictable or vice versa, from the path, you can make a very, very clean measurement of the muon momentum. However, since it is an iron, this is lots of material there, the muon might scatter off 
from the the the, the nuclei of the of the eyebrow. And this multiple scattering might change a little bit the, the muon path. Therefore, it might have a contribution to the systematic error of the muon momentum measurement. Actually, at CMS, this is what dominates it. It's uh, a very interesting perspective, by the way. <laughs> so therefore, the two uh, uh, systematic uh, sources are completely different from each other. But if you measure the dimuon uh, invariant mass, at the Higgs, uh, well, from uh, from the dimion invariant mass, you can reconstruct the, the Higgs mass. And if you measure the same Higgs mass in both detectors, you can tell that, that your systematics is is not playing a role. So what the way I would summarize that in Atlas, they have a very big detector. So they need multiple magnet systems. They have three systems, I believe. And that makes it a very complicated magnetic field to simulate, to model, to understand. So the actual expected trajectory of the muons is more complicated and to determine their momentum, they take a, a longer curve, let's say, and to determine what they expect and how to measure that momentum from that curve is difficult. Uh, whereas for CMS, we just have a very strong magnetic field. So it's more, the, the curve of the muons is more predictable but then there's a bunch of material there. So the mm -hmm. muon can take a slightly yeah. unexpected route from scattering. And that's uh, what makes it a bit more challenging in our case. Actually, both detectors make two measurements on the muon momentum. So uh, in Atlas, they have a solenoidal field that makes a one curvature. And around this, they have a... Uh, Helio, uh, uh, another field that makes a helicoidal, helicoidal thank you, <laughs> field uh, that, that makes a, another uh, turn. So they have one big one and then around it another uh, path. Um, in CMS, on contrary, within the magnet, you have one turn direction, but outside the magnet, you have another one. You can see this in the CMS logo. Exactly, that's why the CMS logo it looks like. Uh, I'm expecting more questions indeed. Yes, we did please get send us more questions. Almost half an hour ago, the last one. <laughs> so I, I started to mention this, but since nobody uh, kind of answered the question, so the, the muon is especially heavy, right? It's very similar to the electron. But the reason is it's very, useful for us, but we need to, uh, since it has a higher mass, it carries more it's momentum. So this is the whole reason why it takes more larger magnetic fields to deflect it. Exactly. Or more distance. Exactly. Exactly. Has. But what you see is uh, uh, one of the two uh, best uh, muon spectrometer has ever been built. The other one is just across the the LHC in Atlas. While we wait for more questions, maybe a pop yeah. quiz. We, we got a question. Oh, we got one. How do you protect the detector from any natural disasters? Um, um, everything at CERN should survive a Richter scale five uh, earthquake, which uh, uh, on the by the statistics arrives uh, once in every 1000 years. So I think we are well protected. Concerning the floods, uh, the so far we didn't have a flood issue uh, uh, in the LHC. I think if it would happen, since it is tilted, we could pump out sooner or later the water from the from the system. Fortunately, we're not yet faced with, and I don't know what is the procedure for that. Um, so there's this last question is interesting because I think it's asking clarification. You mentioned the muons will scatter with the iron. And I think the question is, how do you account for that? Well, in, in everything, so like anytime we look to physics, we do a physics analysis, what we do is we simulate or predict or um, we model what we expect is gonna happen. And that includes what happens when you collide protons at this really high energies, but it also includes how the particles that are produced scatter or interact with the material that's there. So we need to know 
like we have to model our detector we have to simulate it so that means we need a computer model uh, telling us where everything is and what kind of material will particles encounter and how will these particles interact with iron or brass or it could be well the silicon in the in the tracker so all this has to be modeled or simulated there was a question uh what has given better results so far for measuring muons momentum atlas method or cms as far as i know they are very very close to each other i cannot tell who is slightly better or, or slightly 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 better than the other uh, i think it usually, depends on who you ask usually this is yeah exactly <laughs> usually it doesn't i i think that the two are more or less the same actually not only the muon system that makes the detector performance this is uh, this is a much wider thing but just as a general comment this is what we are uh pursuing right when we develop new detectors we're always pursuing more precision right we want to know uh, make we want to take better measurement reduce the the uncertainties the error in order to improve our results but again this is targeting how well do my does my prediction agree with my observation and that's how we learn things you know like you can uh, make a prediction where the higgs exists right and from that prediction you can say if the Higgs exists and it looks like this, I should see an excess of events with these characteristics. And that's what we discovered. Um, and then you can extend that and say, well, what if there was a dark matter particle with these characteristics? Then you could say, well, it should look like this in our prediction. There should be an imbalance of momentum and there should be, uh, if it has this mass uh, and it interacts with these particles in this way, then we should see this many more events that we expect, or, or this fewer events that we expect. In case of a dark matter, this is extremely important. We will see only the visible part. Exactly. <laughs> so that's a very interesting, fascinating. I mean, uh, I don't know how much you guys might know about this. I guess the physicists among you guys uh, will know, but this is this sort of momentum imbalance. It just means that before the collision, all the momentum is going, and you have particles moving at the speed of light, basically, going in this direction. If you sum the momentum in the transverse plane, it's zero before the collision. So if you do that after the collision, you sum the momentum of all the particles in the transverse plane, all the resulting particles, it should also add up to zero. And when it doesn't, it's either... You can even calculate uh, the momentum, the missing momentum. Exactly. So, so sometimes if you have neutrinos that are produced, those can carry away the momentum. So you have to simulate those, model those, Easy, predict those. Uh, and you can also have mismeasurement. You can have particles that uh, it looks like the energy uh, Easy, disappeared, let's say, or is missing, but it's, your detector is not perfect. So you also have to simulate the imperfections in your detector. Uh, so, you know, there's layers and layers of complexity that are very, very interesting. Um, but generally, that's, that's what you have to do uh, to really understand uh, your results and get yeah. better results, right? Exactly. So this this goes uh, to the next question. What are the physics goals for the next run? As Andres mentioned, besides the the new physics that we want to see, the uh, dark matter, we want to see the uh, black holes if they, they exist. We want to see any uh, uh, very exotic things. Besides these, we want to measure the known things more precisely, uh, the Higgs mass and the other 20 parameters that in the standard model that can be measured more precisely. This is one of the, the leading stuff. But uh, here comes the, uh, the story that I used to say about the Santa Maria, uh, that the Santa Maria uh, was built and, and uh, sailed out for a specific reason. Uh, to prove, oh, thank you, I was uh, 20 kilos younger. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Santa Maria has, uh, uh, has to prove uh, a hypothesis and uh, it proved another thing, something unexpected. So I used to say that our detector and all the four detectors are something like the Santa Maria. Uh, we don't know what we will see outside. 
it's uh, exploration. That's why it's so very interesting. Yeah, it's, we we don't know what uh, exactly we're going to invest. Uh, and just to say another quick thing that you know we have this precision. You, you might say, well, what do you want to know more about the Higgs cross section or whatever? Um, but I also you know there, there's one way to do this, right? You can have experiments or SLR. studies where you want to discover a new particle and you might say well there's SLR. more events than you expected but um you can also target very what, we, what i would call precision uh studies where i don't know one good example is the the bs to mu mu where you have a very rare process but you can predict it very accurately you know exactly how often you expect it and if your measurement doesn't agree what you predict then there might be something else there. And this applies to the Higgs. The Higgs is a very massive particle. So it, it would vary, um, well, it, it, it's expected to, to couple, to, to interact with many particles strongly or, or in a strong way. Um, so that's one of the reasons, like uh, the Higgs we hope can become a tool. We've now discovered it, but we hope it can become a tool to explore uh, New physics, if it's there, right? So that's that's another aspect of that. Another question: Do you use Jean four for all those models you describe about the mirrors collisions and missing momentum? The Jean is used for for modeling the the detector. Uh, the DAQ has just stopped. Um, Sorry about the concert. <laughs> <laughs> so well, we have a party here. <laughs> yeah, especially especially in the night at the three three a.m. Yes. It is very useful. Yeah. Um, so the jaunt is used for for modeling the detector and calculating the particle material interactions that are extremely important for us in order to compare our measurements with physics. That's where the physics comes in with the, the various particle generators in the giant. Um, yeah, uh, how many trigger systems do you have in the detector? We have two, two. levels. One is the, the level one, or that means hardware uh, uh, trigger system. This is uh, deployed on the detectors. I think it is part of the FPGA programs and the, the fast connections between the detector parts and there is a high level trigger actually the, the the low level hardware trigger is i think it's trained for something like 50 60 uh, uh things or or trigger events but maybe we should say i mean not all sub detectors participate in that exactly. level one mm -hmm. uh and some of them yet not exactly that's what i was going to point out <laughs> is that part of this high luminosity lhc program and one of the holy grails right is that uh, what the innermost part of the detector, the, the tracking is especially slow because it gives you a lot of information. So one of the things that would be nice and that we're working towards is to have a trigger on all of the system, all yeah, of the system definitely. pretty much. Uh, but right now, I think for CMS, uh, some of the muon systems, the uh, calorimeter systems, but the tracking does not provide uh, exactly. trigger information exactly. yet. Yet. Uh, so this is the, the hardware yeah. level or level one uh, trigger system. There is another one, the high level uh, uh, system. Square. This is just upstairs yeah. from here. So it's a bunch of uh, computers that crunch the numbers. They, they give you a, a bit of more detailed picture. And then you can make a more informed decision whether you want to keep these events or not, whether they're interesting or not, let's say. Yeah. In addition to that, I can tell you some numbers to see how uh, much our trigger power that uh, in the beginning for the collision, we have around 40 megahertz. So it's 40 times 10 or six even per second. Yeah. And then after uh, the soft, uh, sorry, the hardware level one trigger, it reduced to like uh, 100, yes, <laughs> 100 K hertz, but still it's too much to store all this event. Then we have this uh, software, the high level trigger, which reduced to 1000 uh, mm -hmm. event per second or one kilohertz. And, and, just and then the, to, oh yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yes. Well, just to add to that, again, yeah. I keep talking about the upgrades, but that's something else we're trying to improve. That's right now, that's what we can handle in terms of throughput. But for this high luminosity uh, project, right, the high luminosity LHC, 
we not only need to improve the detectors themselves, but the way we read them out. And that is also, you know, the trigger system needs to be revamped and, and we ultimately we need to increase all those numbers. I think we're going up to 750. Yeah, 750 kilohertz. 750 the, kilo for, for yeah, phase two. For the high level mm -hmm. one. And I think six or seven also for the high level three. -er. So mm -hmm. 750 for level one, I think. Mm -hmm. And 7.5 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. for so it is a seven fold. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, we got a physics question. Uh, it is predicted to be uh, an extra Higgs boson, which will be the energy range that it will be found. Yes, exactly. That's the answer. <laughs> so, so far, so, so actually when I, when I learned about the standard model ages ago, um, my teacher told me that, uh, well, of course we learned the, the, uh, the single Higgs boson Thing because th that would be the easiest to explain. But uh, what he told us that the most probable, well, actually that time the Higgs was not discovered, uh, the most probable is a two doublet extension model, the minimum two doublet extension model, which contains five Higgs bosons, apart from that two are uh, uh, charged. Um, obviously the mass was not uh, uh, predicted by any of the, the models. We did some some checks. Actually, this was done not on the LHC, but the lab. <laughs> so you can imagine that I'm old. Um, and uh, and obviously we didn't see anything. What concerns now? We, as far as I know, I don't follow the Higgs search since then. But as far as I know, there is no hint of anything of the the two doublet extension, or it is so far away that uh, it is even not contributing in the in the uh, 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 indirect channels, which is uh, bad news. That said, I mean, I think what Sultan just said is we haven't found any evidence that there's exactly. anything exotic about the Higgs yet, but we don't know. And we're not gonna know, uh, you know, until we get a bunch of data and then we can keep excluding possibilities, right? We can say, well, we don't have, so, so far the Higgs looks vanilla uh, for this ranges of properties of other models that we've uh, considered. Yeah, exactly. Um, is the CMS control room manned 24 seven during the LHC shutdown? No, but uh, as we are approaching, as we are approaching the, the run three period, we bring up more and more detectors. And since now we are, bringing up the DAQ as far as I know, and we're testing it, we get more and more people around. Also in the subdetector area, uh, since the subdetectors need to be, again, to, to bring in life, uh, some of them like the gem, I'm just looking at my colleague there, uh, it is a brand new detector. It is, uh, it has to, it has to really to train to live. <laughs> So, so that uh, obviously, obviously, people are there. Um, the twenty-four-seven becomes very important once we are getting to start the data taking. When the is on, you don't hear. Have a shift of no, it's just us talking. There's no one talking. Take care of There's nothing. Nobody's talking. Oh the, yes, it's just us. Victor, and uh, also we have uh, workers underground and we should uh, monitoring their safety and take care of their safety. So. Whenever the detector is on, we have, as I explained at the beginning of the visit, the shift leader and the technical shifter, and uh, yeah, the rest of shift crew is. So maybe we wish to give you them again uh, in the control room. We miss this uh, this time. But just to maybe give you an idea of what exactly is going on now. We're at this moment. Uh, we're we're doing. Uh, we're, we have a period of data taking where we're collecting cosmics, and so right now, our detectors no protons in the machine, so we are simply uh, looking at what comes from outer space and what reaches mm -hmm. our detector, which is again, uh, you would think. 100 meters of uh, terrain on top of the detector might uh, shield from cosmic rays. And it does to an extent, but we still get plenty of 
uh, muons from cosmic rays and this is good for the alignment exactly so we yeah. can use this to understand the alignment of our detector um, but also you know after this long shutdown there's been many changes in many sub detectors so uh, a lot of the experts are working really hard to uh, you know fix any problems with reading out this cosmic data for example and just here in the control room there's people working all the time just to make sure things are ready for when we actually get protons in run three which again will be sometime in march next year yep about the cosmics maybe i have like a tricky question for the audience i don't know if uh, someone can answer on that or not but how to differentiate between the mean which coming from cosmics and the mean which coming from the interaction point? good question yes so ladies and gentlemen we are expecting the answer for the question of mohammed uh, can you use Cherenkov radiation? Uh, well, we don't have Cherenkov detectors, so. I thought part three check. Well, um, yes and no, no, we don't we don't detect the, the circles. <laughs> right, it's, it's like we the yeah, yeah. But, uh, By having tanks outside the detector, what do you mean by tanks? They are. I don't see the answer to it. Oh, this is what I'm reading up. Yeah. Okay. So I think he's proposing a new sub detector. Exactly. Exactly. But but you can you can the bending. Well, if you turn on the magnet, the the path of the cosmics will will bend. Yes. Direction of muon travel. Okay. You start to sniff tracking and see which muons come from outside so we, of the we, detector. We could, we could just turn the camera and show them the yeah. event display to see if we find uh, a cosmic. Uh, yeah, but, but not now. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. I'm not. Uh, so indeed, I think somebody was extremely close. Yeah. So if you produce a muon during the collision, that will come from the collision point, which is in diameter. I think it is how much it is two millimeters. Less no, it's it's less than. Sorry, the the two two beams are something like the hair. Yes. So it's a couple of hundreds of microns, and the length is a couple of centimeters, and you can trace back the muons to this volume. And in addition, you have a gating, so you know when you expect. Yes. So uh, you, you could have a muon that goes directly through the interaction point, but that's extremely unlikely, right? And in the time, in, in that window. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, it also has to happen. Like, <laughs> not only does it have to go through the interaction point, which is very small, mm -hmm. but it also has to happen at exactly the right also time. So the traces, exactly. you trace the muon from the beginning to the end and see if the muon has a trace on the track in the upside and downside. So you connect these together. And you see this muon not coming from the interaction point, coming from outside. So and one of one exactly. of the guesses was that whether muons, I mean, if they're produced in pairs, and they can be, muons can be produced in pairs, one positive, one negative. But you can also have, uh, you know, a decay or some process where you have a muon and you have a muon neutrino. So you can have actually a single, uh, yep, a single muon, a standalone muon. But it still comes from the interaction point. Exactly. Right. So, so, so that's a. So actually, the the geometrical probability exactly. that is extremely low for creating a force event from from cosmics. However, if it happens, we are we are still saved because we do our analysis on a statistical base. So one event here or there probably will not screw up the results. Yeah. There was one other question that uh, was asked a little bit ago about how long it takes to calibrate the detector. Oh, yeah. And that's a very... Uh, it depends which detector. It depends which detector. And also, have to keep in mind that we don't just calibrate it once, right? It's uh, So at least the detector that I work with, uh, we have to run some kind of calibration or another anytime there's no collisions happening, right? So a typical fill where we have collisions could be 10 hours, 20 hours, even 30 hours sometimes. And there's a period of, let's say, a couple of hours in, in, in average, a couple of hours between where you can do calibrations. So it well, depends on which. I can tell a detector which is calibrated much more often 
This is the, the electromagnetic colorimeter. Hmm. So you know the electromagnetic colorimeter. This is what we just just mentioned. I I had a remark that this was completely transparent. Mm -hmm. So the 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 electromagnetic colorimeter, due to the radiation, will develop uh, so-called color centers that will destroy the the light yield through the detector so, but the, crystal. It it means that the crystal becomes less transparent. Exactly. It becomes more opaque. Exactly. But since you measure the number of the photons exiting from the detector, you you are really depending very much on, on knowing how transparent your crystal is. Yes. So what they do, they have, as far as I know, four very strong lasers, four different wavelengths. And these lights are, are driven to each single detector crystal, 77,000. That's why they need a very strong lasers. And when there is gating but non-colliding, in some of the cases, they do the, the, the calibration. Why do we have gating and non-colliding? And how do we do that? In the LHC, we have bunch trains. We can put in, I think, 2,800 something like bunches in the bunch trains, but it doesn't mean that you have bunches all over the LHC. There will be a part, a couple of, uh, I think, a tens of nanoseconds or hundreds of nanoseconds long, with where you cannot put yeah. bunches because this is needed for the beam. Uh, deflection, the beam switches for the, the dump, magnet. the, yeah. the kicker mm -hmm. magnet. These are uh, uh, the, the gaps, and these gaps are going around in the LHC just like the, the bunches do. And when the gaps collide at CMS, you have gating, but you don't have collisions. And that's the time when the ECAL fires the lasers on, well, not every time and not all the detectors. Actually, this happens 11,000 times per second. Uh, so they just do it, I think, 100, 000, 100 times per, per second. But they do a continuous recalibration of the, the ECAL system. I didn't know it was that continuous. That's really interesting. I, I also think HF has an LED system that might be a bit similar, but I don't, I don't know the details. UGC SLR. Uh, and just to add a little bit more, like when you talk about the LHC itself, UGC there's a lot of interesting SLR. things, but uh, the LHC, as Sultan was saying, we can put in bunches of protons, right? They're just collection of protons that travel together. And there could be, you know, 2,800 or so of them circulating around. Each of those bunches uh, will have like 10 to the 11 protons or so. Because of reasons uh, having to do with accelerator physics and stuff that I don't know anything about, you there's a exactly 3,564 potential locations where you mm -hmm. could put or not put bunches of protons, uh, and this uh, becomes you talked about trains of bunches, so those are consecutive. There's 3,564 places where you could put protons. And if you have them, you know, one after the other sequentially, that's what we call a train. But sometimes you have an individual bunch that uh, is not surrounded by other. Exactly. That's that's usually the test. The so guy. <laughs> I, I <laughs> thought of. I hope we're not like running over time or something. But I, I also had another thought. And I think this is also about ECAL. Uh, ECAL, as far as I know, is one of the most temperature sensitive sensitive detectors, uh, sub detectors in CMS. And from what I recall, I think a change in like 0.1 degree centigrade will have a measurable impact in the performance of the detector. So, uh, it, you know, SLR. just keeping in, it's just a general remark of like New the SLR. Uh, incredible complexity in the CMS detector and these kinds of detectors in general, uh, just thinking of managing, uh, now for example, runs at 20 degrees and you, try to keep it within 0.1 degree around that. Let's say we try. So it has a system to keep the temperature constant. Uh, but ECAL is um, right next to the tracker. And the tracker runs at minus 20 degrees centigrade, give or take. And then when you get closer to the interaction point, you have a vacuum. So that's, you know, but moving out outwards radially, you have a vacuum, then you have the tracker at minus 20. 
then you have the calorimeters, which are plus 20, and then you have a cryogenic superconducting lab <laughs> that's next to that. So just keeping things insulated from each other, temperature-wise, is a big challenge. And uh, you know that that's one of the interesting aspects of just what we what we call, we call the services. Let's say exactly is very uh, just in engineering these things, designing them is also very very complicated, especially for CMS since it's so dense, so compact. Thanks. <laughs> so uh, if we don't have more questions, I think we can wrap up. Cool. Oh, uh, I don't want to. I wanted you to to tell us about your <laughs> okay. experience in uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. when when I uh, they asked it yesterday that to to participate in this uh, visual visit, I was surprised that because it was in Somerset and uh, I was five years ago Somerset here at CMS and uh, when I came to here for the first time there was no COVID so we can be here. And I visited CMS and went underground. I saw the, the guide and I asked myself, ah, one day maybe I, I can be uh, replace this guy. And I was just, okay, oh, come on, you're joking. <laughs> you're kidding. It's never going to happen. But when I got the mail yesterday, I was, oh my God, <laughs> the dream is <laughs> already come true. Yeah. So as so, a summer student, just uh, believe in yourself and uh, don't uh, take. Uh, negative get a negative energy that uh, you cannot do anything but you can do whatever yeah the potential and, is and, yeah, yeah. The and I, I just want to stress that you might have heard that a lot especially from certain people a lot of them might say hey i, I was a yeah, summer, summer student, student sultan, right? sultan was a <laughs> was summer, a summer student, student an undisclosed amount undisclosed amount of time ago <laughs> uh, but you hear that a lot and you hear somebody saying you could you you're a summer student you could make it to cern and work at cern and do amazing work Exactly. And it really like if you look around, and a lot of my colleagues have been certain summer students. Yeah. So, yeah, I think you are on a good track. And actually, you will know that this is probably the best place in the universe. Yes. <laughs> so, so I do, there's a question. Is there anything that the electrodes can be used for? No. Uh, so the question is that concerning the LHC in general. When generating the protons from hydrogen gas, is there anything that the electrons can be used for? No, they go to the ground. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have we have so many electrons. One Coulomb is yeah. ten to the yeah. nine. It's yeah. around us. We have, but it, even even uh, so, there is a bit of detail that you can find about the very the very first stages of acceleration, and this is really something I'm not super familiar with. But there's videos that you can find animations. And I know like one of the first stages, even before the LINAC, the process of stripping the electrons, dual plasma they tron. use a dual plasmatron. I don't know what it does or how it works. But well, actually, this is just a, yeah. this is just a microwave oven. But with the microwave, they shake off the, yeah. the, the electrons. LINAC, the LINAC itself yeah. also has klystrons, which are also that's but, needed to generate the electric field because yeah. of course if you shake it away if, that's not the end of the story you have I, to I think microwaves your... also have something like a klystron yeah that's definitely they, they work at the so it's all it's all microwave ovens in the first <laughs> yeah <laughs> but that was really really good in linux 2 in the past era again uh, more than five years ago we could still bring in visitors to the working in Act Two, starting point, yeah. we could we could really show people that would, the magic that no beam pipe, beam, beam pipe, pipe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that you cannot see anywhere else. All right, ladies, gentlemen. If there is no more question, I think uh, at some point we have to have to close. I. Don't like to say this because uh, yeah. we are all we are all so excited in having this. Let's say but, we are waiting you to come next time. So and yeah, soon yeah. when CERN is open. We everybody. just got a question. So this is usually very good <laughs> yeah. to provoke questions. Uh, how do you clean the beam pipe? Oh, uh, we use a ferret like Fermi did. Um, ah, that's you, a you joke, know, I, I don't know how it is. Oh, oh no, well, we, I, I was I was kind of joking because like in the 60s or 70s. Fermilab, which you probably know what Fermilab is, the US equivalent, 
they had a live ferret called Felicia, mm -hmm. and she would uh, walk through the parts of the beehive <gasps> to clean it. Uh, but in the case of the LEC, I, of course, we don't have a ferret. Uh, it was kind of no, I think I think the vacuum guys would uh, would uh, scream and run out yeah, if they yeah. would hear this. But but you we also have to like bake out the beam pipes, for example, maybe that's a way of cleaning it, if you will. So it is not just cleaning, but also neck coating. So part of the beam pipe can can act as a getter, a at least in, uh, the getter, the, the residual gas getter, uh -huh. uh, at least in, in the, the MS part I saw. Uh, and the bake out is also to activate this getter, again, to activate the neck. Uh, this is a very complex thing. I'm not an expert on this. I just heard something this summer and spring about it because we had to install optical fibers on the beam pipe for measuring the beam pipe temperature. And I got very close to these, uh, these magic things of, of, of uh, neck coating and bake out, etc. cetera. Um, this is really a magic. Um, uh, is it possible for us to come and visit? Yes, definitely. After the COVID. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so unfortunately, for, 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 for the full turn, I think the, the, the big visits are allowed. Well, we, we, we started to have to accept visits at CERN right now for a very small groups, etc. But CMS is a little bit of different. For safety reasons, we have to ban the visits furthermore until October because the second elevator that we didn't show you, the backup elevator, has to be replaced just because it, it reached its lifetime. Um, and obviously, for the visitors, we do not want to degrade the safety. Um, I would say that after October, at least what we discussed in the visit group, we, we are going to rediscuss the situation. And if the COVID allows, we will change our attitude. Uh, sorry for being so uh, politically correct in this, but definitely uh, this COVID thing screwed up the schedule yeah. extremely. I, I would say still, I mean, keep uh, try to keep in touch uh, because if you have a chance, if we manage to make the tours available after October. We only have a little bit of time until we have to close Very again important. for run three. Exactly. So it, it's not really, um, we don't always have the experimental cavern accessible to tours. Um, so I, I, I know this is not, is not helpful, but the open days in 2019 were one of the very, very nice experiences that if you if you were able to come here to CERN in 2019 during mm. September, I think. Yeah, it yes, was in September. September. Yeah, uh, that was amazing because you, know, we could, you could even see parts of the LHC that I'd never we seen. We had more than 6,000 people. <laughs> I missed the season on yeah. it. <laughs> and I regret them. <laughs> so we had, we had almost 6,000 people in two yeah. days. But this is a CMS. In CMS. Only CMS, CMS we are CMS. talking yeah. about. Which is which is kind of the middle of nowhere in France, so it's pretty. It's even more re remarkable to me that people <laughs> yeah. actually made it out here. I guess we can show very interesting things. To this is why. Yeah, why I'm the impressed practice. to see how much people are interested to see what the yeah. and what they are yeah. doing yeah. here. So in the meantime, and also during the operation, we cannot allow the the physical visits in the in the, in the experimental alarm. cavern. But when we don't have uh, uh, beams, we probably can allow the camera to go down. Uh, so very probably the virtual visit is the, is the, the, the product that we can offer for a longer period. All right. So I would say thanks for thanks for joining us today. And sorry for the, the technical hiccup at the beginning. Uh, this was something unexpected. In the morning, we had another virtual visit without any flows. Um, but anyway, fortunately, we solved it. And uh, at least I can tell for, for our five people that we enjoyed it very much. And I yes. hope you enjoyed it on the other side of the screen. Too. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. Thank you. Thank ciao, you ciao. See you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks.